Well, as we get settled in here, and for those of us who will be coming slightly later than the start time, let me introduce the school here in the Institute of Rural Politics, for those of you who are new. We are a uh, graduate school teaching um, the full spectrum of the appreciation of national power and the arts of statecraft and their ethical practice. My name is Kevin Dunn. Um, I'm subbing in for a colleague today doing the introduction. But if you have any questions about the school, feel free to approach me and I can send you in the right direction. So today we have the distinct honor of welcoming a speaker who has been with the IWP community for some time. Her name is Caitlin Schindler. She'll be presenting on the lecture today entitled Origins of Public Diplomacy in U.S. Statecraft, Uncovering a Forgotten Tradition. A little brief background about her before we begin. She obtained a Master of Arts in Strategic Intelligence from here, the Institute of World Politics, uh, while studying, uh, in 2010. And while studying at IWP, Caitlin worked as a technical writer executive officer for a U.S. defense contractor supporting various government con uh, customers, mainly in the areas of counterterrorism and policy and operations. In 2015, she completed her PhD at the University of Leeds in the U.K., studying under the direction of Nicholas Cull from the University of Southern California, and her research focused on the role of intelligence and national techniques of strategic communication including the use of propaganda, public diplomacy, and political warfare uh, in the practice of statecraft. So no doubt congruent to what she studied here as well as what she is uh, going to be speaking on today. She is currently employed as a, um, by Bilegos, and she is also a research professor here at the Institute of World Politics. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out, and without further ado, let me see the floor to our honorable speaker. Let's give her a round of applause. Hey. Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. Um, I would like to take some time here to thank some of the people who provided tremendous support to me through my research and writing of this book. I would like to thank the faculty of the Institute of World Politics, who, as I will explain later, helped inspire my research. I would also like to thank my advisors, Professor Nicholas Cull and Simon Popple. And most of all, I would like to extend my love and gratitude to my family, especially my mom and dad, who are here with me today. So I want to start by telling you a story about the United States. Imagine, if you will, the U.S. is at war, and the president of the United States has just set up blockades in an effort to interdict supplies Going, and goods going to the enemy. A U.S. diplomat arrives in his posted country, we'll call it Country X, a major trade partner of the U.S., and he is met by anxious merchants asking about what this blockade means for them. The diplomat decides that it is of the utmost importance that he delay his journey to the capital and meet with these merchants. He stays three days speaking to merchants. When this U.S. ambassador finally arrives at his post in the capital of Country X, he finds the host nation is not only politically divided, but dealing with tremendous social change. The ambassador also observes in his reports to the Secretary of State that the people and the political leaders of the country do not understand why the U.S. is fighting. They do not understand the nature of the conflict. This U.S. ambassador also reports that given the political situation in Country X, the political leaders are very much attuned to and swayed by public opinion, especially about issues pertaining to the United States. Continuing the war becomes contentious after the U.S. fights several very bloody battles with tremendous loss of life. Country X offers to mediate and questions the value of continuing to fight with such loss of life. The Secretary of State is incensed by these offers and refuses them. Further complicating relations between the U.S. and Country X are the insulting and baiting remarks made by the Secretary of State in the public and the press, including suggestions that the U.S. might invade Country X's territory in another part of the world. As the Ambassador's son reported to his brother, 
People in Country X viewed the Secretary of State as an ogre who intended to eat their nation whole. The Secretary of State was also quoted in the press as saying that the best way to win an American election was to insult Country X because everyone knew the American public hated Country X. Despite numerous reports from, ambassador, from the ambassador and Country X and other ambassadors posted around the world warning the Secretary of State to clearly define America's reasons for continuing the war and to consider carefully how public opinion influences U.S. relations, the Secretary of State replied angrily to these reports. He said wars are not won by foreign public sympathy, and he further blamed the other nations for undermining the United States' war efforts. He suggested that the nation saw the U.S. as a competitor and desired to see America lose. Relations between the U.S. and Country X evolved further when the press in Country X revealed a spy ring was operating within their country. The ambassador was unaware of this spy ring, though the Secretary of State provided secret funds to another ambassador to set up the ring. Between the Secretary of State's insulting remarks, threats of invasion, and the revelations of the spy ring, the people of Country X and the political leaders in the country began to consider war with the US. Tensions were so great the ambassador was unsure week to week whether he might be sent home. Shortly after the spy ring was made public, a US, uh, U.S. naval ship stopped and boarded a state vessel of, the, of Country X. There, the admiral of the U.S. ship forcefully removed two enemy diplomats. The diplomats were taken back to the U.S. and held in a military prison. The U.S. Ambassador and Country X reported to the Secretary of State that the public was demanding war and the leadership of Country X was not opposed to public sentiment. In the midst of the international incident, the President's Cabinet met and were alarmed by the reports of enemy diplomats en route to Europe to make appeals for support. After some debate, the Cabinet decided to send respected, prudent citizens to Country X and other European nations to specifically engage with the public. Some of the members of cabinet, as well as some of the Americans asked to undertake this mission, questioned whether the whole thing was appropriate. Was it right to send non-official or semi-official representatives to engage with the people abroad? What if the mission became public? What would the people think? What would Americans think? What would the people of the other nations think? No notice was given to the ambassador and country acts of this group of prudent, respected citizens who were going to engage the people of country acts in European countries until one of those individuals showed up on the ambassador's doorstep. But the press and country acts covered their arrival and reported that the purpose of the mission was to understand public opinion within the country and to understand the views of political leaders as well as explain America's position. This mission of public diplomats and country acts in Europe wrote editorials and the leading newspapers gave public addresses and sermons and interacted with social leaders. The editorials attempted to explain America's actions and refute claims of misconduct against the America's enemy. Public addresses and sermons attempted to explain the reasons why the U.S. would not agree to mediation. Some of these efforts were very uh, successful and some backfired, causing more damage to the U.S. Uh, to U.S. relations with Country X. After engaging with the public of Country X for several months, the U.S. ambassador provided the Secretary of State his thoughts on the mission. In general, he was very supportive and reported that the mission was successful. But he did observe that this type of mission, where the citizens from the U.S. came as private citizens, that um, it suggested to the public there that the U.S. administration did not have faith in the official representation. He also observed that such a mission must be very well coordinated with the ambassador to avoid any miscommunication or misunderstanding which might contradict the ambassador's own statements. The ambassador urged that such missions should be kept very distinct from appointed diplomats. With this advice in mind, another group of prudent and respected citizens were sent again to engage with the public of Country X. 
Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to when this took place? Sir? Sounds like 1812. Cool. Sir? I, it was a civil war. Yes. George George was sex yes. So this story took place in 1861 through the first year of the Civil War. The ambassador in the story is Charles Francis Adams, John Adams' grandson. And Adams was appointed to be the U.S. ambassador to Britain just as Abraham Lincoln signed an order to establish the blockade against the southern United States. Secretary of State William Seward ordered the U.S. ambassador to Belgium, Henry Sanford, to establish a spy ring in London and Liverpool to track Confederate agents who were working to have warships built. Mr. Mason and Slidell, Mr. And Ms., uh, Mr. Mason and Mr. Slidell were forcibly removed from a British mail ship, the RMS Trent, and the event nearly brought the U.S. and Britain to war. The British Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston, ordered British troops and ships to Canada based primarily on various threats who were made in the public um, about invading Canada. Relations were so tense between the U.S. and Britain that Adams only rented his accommodations in London week to week through the duration of the war. <laughs> Thurlow Weed and Bishop McElvain were the part of that group of prudent, respected citizens who traveled to England to engage the British public on behalf of the U.S. Weed's efforts tended to backfire, whereas Bishop McElvain was more successful in representing America's positions regarding the war and other issues to the British public. When thinking about U.S. public diplomacy history, some of you are likely very familiar with the well-known and repeated history of U.S. public diplomacy starting either from World War II or as far back as 1936 or maybe even World War I. So the question is, is public diplomacy an American tradition? Especially if, as you're familiar, if you're familiar with the issues facing public diplomacy, how fraught it is. The idea for the book came from my time as a student here at the Institute of World Politics. I was actually sitting in this room as a student almost 10 years ago when I learned about the concept of public diplomacy. As I finished my master's and I was working full-time in counterterrorism policy, I wanted to understand why the U.S., which used public diplomacy so readily to help obtain independence from Great Britain, struggled to use public diplomacy effectively today. Much, in, much of who and what America is is defined by its national tradition and past. And because it is shaped by its past and traditions, I wanted to look at the past to understand why the Founding Fathers used public diplomacy so easily but by the 20th century, public diplomacy became bogged down in debates about what it was, what it should do, or what it shouldn't do, and who should manage public diplomacy. So the question remains, is U.S. public diplomacy a lost tradition? In my book, I conclude that it is. Tradition, especially when considering American traditions, can be a charged concept. So, if you'll bear with me a moment, let's consider some definitions of tradition. And these from the Oxford English Dictionary. And they define it two ways. There are a couple definitions, but these seem the most appropriate. Any practice or custom which is generally accepted and has been established for some time within a society, social group. Or a belief, a statement, custom, handed down by non-written means, word of mouth, or practice from generation or to generation. While public diplomacy in the U.S. is not a well-known or understood history, the U.S. did use public diplomacy at various points throughout the nation's history, intermittently and often when the nation was threatened. However, looking at public, American public diplomacy from 1776 through 1948, several patterns emerge across time where the U.S. did use public diplomacy. And there are two key findings which lead me to the conclusion that U.S. public diplomacy is in fact a tradition of American statecraft. First, many of the problems and debates facing public diplomacy today are not really that dissimilar to those confronted in the past. And many of the debates and problems of the past and today are tied to national traditions and historical experience. Let's reconsider the story I told at the beginning of this presentation. 
I'm sure there were some elements of it that we could see parallels to the discussions of things happening today. Secondly, from my perspective, more, most crucially, there were repeated demands for and a consistent belief that the U.S. should not practice diplomacy like the old world, that a nation which believed in the sovereignty of the people should practice diplomacy with the same democratic principle and should naturally forge relations with the public of other nations. And tied to this belief was the idea that as the world became more democratic, more free, diplomacy and foreign relations would need to engage the public as much or more than the state. This idea that it was right, that it made sense, and that it was American to engage with the people of another nation was a recurring belief without, throughout the history of U.S. public diplomacy. And this was demonstrated by Benjamin Franklin in his time as America's first public diplomat in France, who saw countries as people not as governments, as one historian points out. And much to the frustrations of John Adams, insisted on meeting with and spending more time with the people of France than milling about Versailles with the other diplomats. This was also demonstrated by Lincoln's decision to send public diplomats to England and France, as well as his public replies to addresses of support from the working classes of England. It was also acknowledged by many citizens throughout the research period, traveling all over the world, who observed that America would be impeded in its foreign relations because of the misinformation and misunderstanding about the United States that exists among different people around the world. It's also noted by diplomats serving in Jamaica, Mexico, Turkey, Venezuela, Switzerland, Finland, Guatemala, and other places, who believed that it was not only important for the U.S. to engage with the public of other nations, but also that such engagement would lend itself to maintaining peace by mitigating misunderstanding and the fear of other cultures. And finally, this belief was also illustrated through the passage of the smith mudd Act in 1948, when officers in the State Department saw colonies transitioning to independent democratic nations and believed U.S. diplomacy would need to adapt. This is the unwritten belief, reiterated from generation to generation, that public diplomacy is important and should be a part of the U.S. This is why I call it a lost tradition. It is my hope that with this book, people will become not only more familiar with America's public diplomacy of the past, but also begin to see why it is so important and that it should be a part of American statecraft.